Good day, everyone. Uh, we're currently going to be looking into um, one more um, level three uh, practice assessment from advanced bookkeeping, and this is going to be the second practice assessment available in the AAT website. Um, we already know uh, this uh, qualification is going to come uh, to the end at this year, uh, means in uh, this August. Most of the institution will be moving on to AQ 2022. But if you either in, um, you know, like any exam uh, pending on this unit or you have reset to do, or even if you're an apprentice, uh, the apprenticeships, they will be still keeping AQ 2016. So therefore, I thought it would be beneficial uh, if I do these videos and um, uh, uh, do a complete set of all the units which is available for the advanced diploma in accounting students. And this is uh, certainly one of those, um, you know, um, units people did ask uh, for me to do a video. Obviously, this is one of the, the tougher units overall. Uh, when you do level two, obviously, you know, you have two bookkeeping units, uh, bookkeeping transaction and bookkeeping control. Uh, advanced bookkeeping, it is something of an advanced means it's a combination of those two and then it will take that to the next levels. So therefore it is very important you uh, have to perform well on this to have any chance of progressing to level four. And then of course this is a kind of a, a barometer for you to uh, test where you're standing with your bookkeeping knowledge and uh, you know the understanding of your debits and credits and all the logical solution related to accounting. And then of course this exam is for two hours and it normally has five questions and these five questions are split into various criteria. but of course when we're going to do that you're going to actually going through um you know kind of a, a different um, kind of setup when you go into the exam you're going to be seeing random questions from different different uh, sections but they all basically means this is how this particular exam is structured these five sections are as you you have learned in the past also it's going to be coming back and tested in uh, different different methods so let's uh, without further ado let's start this assessment so uh, this is two hours and we get uh, i'm pretty sure it's five questions but let's check here it is five questions yeah so basically i would normally allow about um, you know, two hours means 120 minutes divide by five. It's going to be 24 minutes a question. I would say I'll allow about 15 to 20 minutes for each question. So you'll have a little bit of time to go back and check everything again before you press the submit button. And of course, um, this is going to be um, uh, how you're going to be managing your time. It's also going to be coming very important because I have seen um, students do run out of time, but question number five sometimes tend to be the easiest and students didn't have the appropriate time to finish everything off uh, once you get there. So let me start by doing the first question. This task is about non-current assets. You are working on the accounting records of a business known as AMBR trading. AMBR trading is VAT, uh, registered for VAT, and the business has part exchange an uh, item of machinery used in its workshop. The following is the relevant purchase invoice. So if you look at that here now, this is what is the purchase invoice now. They have bought a screen printer, compatible flow stand for SP4200, supply and fit on the premises. So that is something you added on. The screen printing mesh of 100 meter roll at that price and altogether is there. You have the net total and then you have the VAT and the total amount there. They're saying here part exchange with printer PM101, the balance of 5,306 pound and 40 pence settled by higher purchase agreement. So there are certain things going on here. We just have to find out what is your real expense when it comes to it, okay? So let's see what it is. So here, the VAT can be reclaimed on the purchases of these items. Of course, whatever you purchase, you can reclaim the VAT on the mass. So that's a different story. The following information relates to the printing machine replaced by the business. So the description of the printer PM 101, which is seen here already, um, where it is here. This is the one they part text. So the printer was bought on 1st of October 2000X4. The date of sale is going to be 31st of July 2006. So I'm going to say 2014 and 2016. Part exchange value was this 1,750 pounds. 
plus the VAT. Okay, so in this scenario, the net amount is the one going to be crucial for us when it comes to your non. Uh, what is that again? The uh, the asset register, non-current asset register. So let's see this here. They're saying here AMBR trading has a policy of capitalizing expenditure over 750 pounds. So here, if you look at that now, uh, any uh, expenses, uh, anything um, uh, like capitalizing expenditure over 750 pounds. Plant and machinery is depreciated uh, over eight years on a straight line basis, assuming no residual value. Motor vehicles are depreciated at 25% per year on a definition um, balance basis. The full year depreciation is applied on the year of acquisition and none in the year of disposal. So these are the things you have to keep in mind when you're going to be filling out the non-current asset register. So they are also asking here, any acquisitions on the current non-current assets, any disposal on the non-current asset of the non-current assets and the depreciation has to be recorded here. Not every cell will require an entry. Not all cells will accept entries. Show your numerical answers to two decimal places. Use D, D, M, M, Y, Y. Means date, month, years in that sixth uh, digit format for any dates. Extract from the non-current asset register. So this is what they have given you. And if you notice some of those things here, you can select and some of them it doesn't accept anything here so because the cursor is actually blinking here but the cursor is not going in. so this is the only place you can think of so here the year end the depreciation charge if you notice that here is being depreciated at a um, what we call again a straight line basis with no residual value so if the goods were bought at, uh, at 2800 pounds the Useful life period of that product is going to be, if you divide by 350, is eight years. So most of these assets they're acquiring now, we have to assume it has eight years, as it says here as well, eight years on straight line basis. So even the next print also has to be depreciated accordingly. Okay, so we have to divide it by eight of your total value uh, or the, the cost of the product. And then, of course, you're going to be... Um, depreciating them accordingly okay so bear with us please let me check how i'm going to be doing the depreciation charge for the pm001 this printer here will have no depreciation at the year end because it says here the year full uh, depreciation is applied in the year of acquisition none in the year of disposal so there is nothing here the carrying amount at the end of it will be also zero because the goods been uh, what do you call it, disposed of the disposal proceeds are how much we will receive for that one. It is going to be 1,750 pounds. We're not going to use the VAT here, and we also use the two decimal places. Please do not leave without these zeros, because you have to assume, even it says there, uh, what do you call it? It's uh, the full amount. We need to keep them to two decimal places. The date of disposal is going to be the day we acquired the uh, the other product, which is 31st of July here, or here also you see in the date of sale. So we're going to use that date here, 31.07.16, okay? So, one second, please. Let me just grab the other file quickly before you get there. Uh, the next one, if you look at that here, we have the screen printer, the compatible flow stand for SP4200. And then you also notice the screen print mesh roll 100 meter. So this screen print mesh roll, it's something you have to use it to, what do you call, uh, operate it. It can run without that as well because it's something you have to use it. Once it finished, we have to just keep on putting the new one here every time you buy. It finishes, so it is some, something you're going to be expensing it in the business. But this other one here, compatible flow stand for SP4200, which fitted at the premises. So that means without this particular product, this screen printer will not be able to operate. So this word they have used here, they have the policy of capitalizing any expenditure over 750 pounds. It will not apply to this particular product. 
Why? Without this particular product, your screen printer is inoperable. Therefore, it must be added to the cost of the printer when we're going to be uh, installing it because it is simply increasing the value of that asset. So let's see how much is the initial cost or the, 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 the purchase cost of it without the part exchange value. So we're going to look at 4,950 plus 596 pounds. It gives you 5,546 pounds. So here on my non-current re asset register, I need to make sure I choose the right print of the printer is going to be print and the stand for SP4200. OK, so we're not going to do the uh, the, the stand itself. We just going to say printer and stand. The date of acquisition is going to be the date we purchased, which is the 31st of July 2016. So here this is the date we bought it. 31st of July. 2016. June here. Always oh, complete those two months. 5.4600 is the, the, the cost. The depreciation charge at the year end is going to be divide this by eight because we are not going to do a part depreciation here. We have to do the, the full month cost, uh, so full yearly cost here, because they haven't told us you have to prorate uh, the the non current. Uh, what is that again? The, the 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 depreciation, the depreciation according to this list, a full year of depreciation is applied in the year of acquisition, none in the year of disposal. So made our life a lot easier. The depreciation is going to be coming down to six hundred and ninety three pounds and twenty five pence. So that means my carrying value it's going to be whatever left minus that and that should give me a value of 4852 pounds and 75 pence this is my carrying value and then they also ask you the funding method is going to be high purchase and there is no proceed from disposal or anything like that here because this one is just an acquisition of an asset now but then we still have something more to do because there are more assets here. We need to make sure we fill the, the right uh, depreciation for them for the year at the end, and then we have to find the carrying value. But these are what we got left now are motor vehicles. Motor vehicles have a different depreciation policy. According to them, the motor vehicles are depreciated 25% for the year on a diminishing balance basis. So on the straight line basis, we have to find out the depreciation is going to be same every year. The reason it just reduces that value of it from the original cost. But then when it comes to the diminishing basis, the diminishing base, uh, diminishing base uh, balance basis are only depending on what is left on your asset, what value is left on, which is the carrying amount. So we're going to depreciate the carrying amount by 25%, and then whatever left over will be going as the next year carrying amount now. So let's have a look at that complete asset here. Uh, the motor vehicle BTO 40HU, the carrying amount currently is 5,310 pounds and 20, uh, 36 pence. And I'm going to multiply by that by 25%. That should give me a depreciation of 1,327 pounds and 59 pence. It is basically a quarter of that value. And the three quarters of the value will be going as the, the year end carrying value for that particular motor vehicle. And that motor vehicle will be again depreciated a 25% of this value on the next year. So just start to keep an eye out for that again and again. So the next van is PW06 KJF. The carrying value of that one is going to be 6,540. Multiply by 25%, which is going to be giving you 1635. Make sure you put the decimals there with the zeros. And then you're going to find what is the, uh, the new carrying value. It is going to be that amount. You can either take this away from that or simply multiply by three because uh, this is 25% and this is going to be the 75%. So it's just a mathematical 
uh, you know, trick you can use when you come to percentages. If they say 20%, because the 20% is going to be one of five, and uh, the other part, 80% will be uh, four of five. So it's going to be multiplied by four if you hear they say 20%. If they say 10%, you can do the same way as well. But it can be only if it's going to be easily divisible. Uh, you know, if you can divide the 100 with those percentages. If you get 30%, uh, you cannot do that because you cannot simply uh, split the 30% from the 100%. And then also they're asking you one more, more question there. Which one of the following best describe the residual value of the non-current asset? What is the residual value? It says here, expected market value at the estimated date of its disposal. Next one, they're saying, difference between its carrying amount and estimated scrap proceeds. Third one is, the original cost less its depreciation to date. And the last one is going to be carrying amount plus its accumulated depreciation at any given time. All of them have different answers for that. Let's start with the bottom one. Carrying amount plus this accumulated depreciation. So if you look at that here, whatever you got here, this carrying amount and the accumulated depreciation here. So if you add all of those depreciation charges and this amount, if you add them all together, you will give you 9,440 pounds. So this is basically the, the cost, the asset value cost is going to be the the total carrying amount plus all its accumulated depreciation at given time. So this is not the answer. Original cost less is less its depreciation today. So this is your original value. Less all of this depreciation to date will give you the final carrying amount. So this is not also meaning the residual value. Third one, difference between the carrying amount and the estimated scrap proceeds. This is going to be your either gain or loss in disposal. This is not the residual value because you may have a carrying amount there and estimated scrap proceeding, and then you're going to be looking at whether you made a gain or loss at disposal. So this is not, but this one on the other hand, expected market value at the estimated date of disposal, it's going to be what we call the residual value. So normally if I buy an asset and that asset has five years um, uh, useful life period, and therefore, once the, once the end of the life is achieved at the end of five years, what can that asset can be sold to? Means expected market value will be the, um, uh, at the date of disposal will be your residual value. They call it as a residual value because it can be very small. May not be the amount you paid at the beginning when you bought that item. So that will be the answer for that. Three marks for that. I just simply don't know, but it is a really good question. Now, let's look at the next question, shall we? This task is about ledger accounting for non-current assets. You are working on the accounting records of a business for the year ended 31st of March 2017. That can be ignored. So here you don't have to worry about that at all, so which is a bonus. Then an equipment was part exchange for a new model on 31st of July 2016. The original equipment was bought for £4,500 on 11th of June 2014. So. Depreciation is provided over three years on a straight line basis, assuming no residual value. So whatever we bought, we're going to depreciate it for three years. That means every year we're going to depreciate it 33.33333 perpetual amount. So you're going to divide it by three to find one year's depreciation charge for that uh, non-current asset. And then, of course, they're saying here, for all classes of non-current assets, a full year of depreciation is applied at the year of acquisition and none in the year of disposal. And then part exchange allowance was £850 given towards the item and £5,180 was paid from the bank to complete the purchases of the equipment. So now we're going to look at it now. 
we can find out with this information given the new asset itself new asset we have paid 5180 pounds from the bank and then also there was 850 pounds part exchange allowance given so therefore the new assets value what do you call the purchase cost was 5180 plus 850 so 5180 plus 850 that gives you a 6030 pounds as my cost of that particular asset when we bought it but before we do this we have to find out what will be the previous the one we sold off or one we partixed uh, what was the the accumulated depreciation for that one so let's start with it now so the year we bought it on it's going to be third 11th of june 2014 the year first year end is going to be on 31st of march 2015 so for that year 1500 pounds was charged as my depreciation because if you notice that it charges the full depreciation for the year of acquisition the full year depreciation is going to be one third of this original equipment's cost so 4500 divided by three will give you the first year depreciation of 1500 pounds and then also from that day onwards first of april 2015 to 31st of march 2016 there will be another charge of 1500 uh, depreciation to that particular non-current assets so therefore the total accumulated depreciation at the end of uh, the, the year end of 31st of March 2016 is standing at 3,000 pounds. The goods were sold off or mean partex on 31st of July 2016. There will not be any depreciation charges there. So they are asking you what is the accumulated depreciation. For us, we know it is 3,000 pounds because that is what we charge for the previous two financial years. So now what we're going to do, we're going to look at the disposal accounts show clearly the balance to be carried down or transferred to the statement of profits or loss as appropriate so now when we're going to look at it how are we going to do the disposal account so normally the non-current asset um let me bring another sheet down here um see whether i can bring a spreadsheet give me a second please i'll be able to do with the spreadsheet it's a lot easier if i do a t account there uh, once it starts up, I'll be able to bring that parallelly to the screen and show that to you how this gets looked at when we're going to be doing the disposal account. this place we still got plenty of time let's get a little bit of an excel if it decides to load up Got the Excel working now.
Hey. Let me go to the teams, but I can't show how to call it. Hey. So here, I have got the spreadsheet on one side, and then I have the, the teams. Oh, for some reason I couldn't do it unless it's not in the full screen. OK, so yeah, so we have this now here. So the. Equipment. At cost is going to be like this. And then this is going to be my acute mu. And this is going to be my disposal. OK, so let's assume it that way. OK, so let's see. This is the bank account. It, this is going to be a lot easier. Um, oh, no. Uh, we'll leave that as it is, and we can do this in this particular question parallelly this way. OK, so bear with us, please. Let me just bring it over here. Yeah, that's a lot better now. OK, so. We start the equipment at cost here whenever we bought that goods. This is my uh, initial amount, what we paid for. I say bank, 4,500 pounds. This is what we bought. The end of year, first year, we're going to say depreciation charges, 1,500 pounds. Depreciation charges, 1,500 pounds. We have applied all these here now. And then now, when we're going to dispose of it, we're going to create the disposal account, and then we're going to transfer this non-current asset into the disposal account first. So if I'm going to credit my equipment at cost account, the disposal account will get the same entry equipment at cost on the debit side. So basically, we're transferring the value of that non-current asset into the disposal account. Similarly, we're going to transfer this also into the disposal account because we want to get rid of any accounts associated with this particular non-current asset. So here, three thousand pound is being uh, sent through to uh, the disposal account. Okay, so here we're going to say, uh, okay, accumulated depreciation of three thousand pounds. So these two accounts now basically cleared of any balance. They no longer have any balance to go with it. So here, the new vehicle, so new equipment at cost. So here, the one we have actually bought, it's valued at 6,030 pounds. We already come across that with that figure we have given here. But what we need to remember also, this one, it's only been part covered by the bank of 5,180. And then the rest of that was given to you whilst they disposing the goods uh, because by a part exchange value of 850 pounds. So this value will be going in here on the disposal account. This will go towards the, the new equipment at cost. So if equipment at cost is going to be 850 pounds was given towards that now. So once we add it all together, there is a still a discrepancy of 650 pounds. The 650 pounds, we have to put it down to the loss at disposal. We're going to say this one, this will be transferred to the profit and loss account as a loss on disposal for 850 pounds. So if you notice that, this equipment at cost, we get transferred that new value here, and this one will be whatever we're going to be putting on our profit and loss statement, and this will be classed as a loss on disposal because we didn't get the whole 1,500 pounds which was left on the carrying value. The, the We did assume there will be no residual value there, but since we got rid of the goods in the middle of the year, there can be no depreciation charged on that non-current asset. But 
we did get, in fact, some part exchange value. So even with that way, it is not a whole loss to the business because we basically used for that time period and whatever we use there, we have to assume we lost that as a depreciation. If you didn't lose this way, we would have lost it as a depreciation at the end of the, the usual, uh, what you call a useful life period. OK, so in this scenario, it is not a big deal to think about it as a whole. But this is how the disposal accounts will look like. So if you notice that here on the spreadsheet, I made it a little bit more easier for you to look into because this is how these accounts get closed off because this all equipment and cost account has no longer any, uh, any value on it. The accumulated depreciation for that particular equipment cost also have no longer any, have any value on it to carry over to the next year, but the new equipment at cost it starts with that value. And then, of course, we have to depreciate it as we done on the previous unit, but they haven't asked about that yet. OK, so they here is asking you calculate the purchase cost of the new equipment from the information about which we already calculated. It's six thousand and thirty pounds because eight hundred and fifty pounds part exchange value and then five thousand one hundred and eighty was the value they paid from the bank account. So that amount is being calculated as well. So now they're saying here before the part ex, um, exchange entries were posted, the balance on the equipment at cost account was nineteen thousand three hundred and eighty pounds. So here nineteen thousand three hundred and eighty pounds, which is inclusive the old asset but not including the new assets. So now what we have to do, they're asking you to calculate what will be the final balance carried on when the ledger accounts were closed for the year. We can simply do this way as well. So let's change this account uh, instead of new and old. Just ignore whatever we have done here. So let's put this down to this account only. Total equipment at cost initially had a total value of 19,380 pounds. We have got rid of it, disposal, 4,500 worth of items, and we gained a new unit worth 6,030. So the new value, it's going to be simply put, the just if you're going to total this account, uh, 19,380 plus 6,030, minus 4,500, and it's going to be 20,000. That will be the answer there, 20,910 there. So let me go back to teens quickly. So we will change that to only the surpass view, which you get allowed to your practice questions, okay? Yes, get this full screen so we can do a little bit better on that. See what I can zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, that's even better. See that screen a little bit better now. Okay. Now they're asking you, there's a bit of a dot, dot, dot line there, so it's completely different part of the same question, but nothing to relate to the one above. If you see that lines there, that means it's a different section of the same question. Uh, on 30th of March, 2017, new fixtures and fittings were purchased. These were funded by a loan from a family member. You are given the following information. Purchase cost is that 3,248. Depreciation charge just for the year ended on 31st of March uh, 2017 is 406 pounds. They ask you to complete the journal below. This question can be really tricky for you guys when you don't read the questions carefully. Look at the narrative here. The narrative is depreciation charges for the year ended on 31st of March for the fitting and fi fixtures uh, fixtures and fittings purchased on 31st 30th of March 2017 they haven't asked anything about anything else this is simply the depreciation charges do you have to worry about this purchase cost no do you have to worry about how that was funded the funded by a loan on the family member no no you don't have to worry about any of it all you need to care about this 406 pounds because that is all the narrative matches for us for you 
the depreciation charge is an expense to the business. So we will do a debit amount for that one. And then this depreciation charge get put into the accumulated depreciation cost for the fittings and furniture. So let's see here, here you go. Fitting, sorry, fixtures and fittings accumulated depreciation. This will be getting a credit entry there. So therefore the amount of 406 pounds for the fittings and furniture, no, hold on again. I'm, I don't know why I'm keeping that by these fixtures and fittings, because in Sage, you have normally furnitures and uh, fixtures uh, as your, um, one of your non-current assets there. Maybe I'm got used to that a lot. So this one is how you have to record. It is very clear this is the narrative for this particular depreciation charge and the accompanying uh, accumulated depreciation. Also, if you notice here on the first instance, if you didn't scroll down, you only see the equipment accumulated depreciation. You may be inclined to select this by accident, but it is clearly nothing to do with that. It is to be doing with the fixtures and fittings accumulated depreciation. So please, if there is a scroll down, bar like that way, go all the way to make sure you have selected the, the right option instead of the incorrect one. And it, this can be a downfall to a lot of students. You get one marks for this, one mark for that, and one mark for that one. And then of course, that is what you get the old three marks. And this question is a lot harder, you get three marks, and the one previous question, you should get only one or two, but they also give you three marks. So it's kind of a uneven balance to the, the, the weight of each questions. Now let's move on to question number three. So here they're asking, this task is about ledger accounting, including accruals and prepayments. How many of you had nightmares about this accruals and prepayments? Of course, this is the one of the pay, uh, things you always look into. The advanced bookkeeping can be the make or break for most of the students, accruals and prepayments. They can be the nastiest thing you ever come across in any type of accounting. It is simply because you're missing the overall picture of it. Because when it comes to accruals and prepayment, it's not much tricks there. All you have to remember, your accrual accounting concept. Your accrual accounting concept says, the expense or income, whatever it is, it has to be recorded when they occurred, not when they are paid. So therefore, certain transactions may have to be recorded on the previous accounting period, even though the payment was made on the current period or the other way around, vice versa. Okay, sometimes you may get paid early and the work didn't get done until the following accounting period. Therefore, you have to look into this as a, a clash of timing. So it is simply down to how you're going to display this knowledge into your accounting powers. And also, it is very easy if you can draw a timeline when it comes to a question like that way. Always, always trying to find a way, it makes it visually understandable for you. You get a piece of paper or anything like that way, just a book, just do a timeline and say, okay, from this to this to this to this, this should be when I have to be charged. But unfortunately, this is something you have to find a way to do yourself. Most of the time, this can be done which is simple timeline, but I'll probably try and show that to you whilst we're doing this question. So they're saying here, yeah, the business policy accounting for accruals and payment, prepayments and entries made into the income or expenses account and an opposing entry into the relevant asset or liability account. In the following period, this entry is reversed. It has to be done that way. If you don't reverse it, that particular asset or liability the account will continue to exist because they shouldn't exist. You only keep it for the purpose of my profit and loss statement and the statement of financial position. Simply we do that at the end of the year. And once it finished, when you go to the new period, we have to reverse that figures. Once we reverse it, those account, uh, the amounts will go back into their relevant accounts as a accrual or prepayment. Then we have to settle it accordingly. So here you're looking at rental income for the year. Cash book for the year shows the receipt of rental income of 25,550. This include 2,720 for the period from 1st of April 2017 to uh, 30th of April 2017. Okay, so therefore, according to this, there is a payment we got paid 
in advance. So they're saying here, this is the end of March 2017. This was the total receipt we have received, but this amount here was prepaid for the month of April that was prepaid on the previous year. So therefore, this is a prepaid income. If an income was prepaid to you, what that become to you? You have to think about it as this point. If your income is coming to yourself all the time, if somebody don't pay your income, that will become an accrued income because they owe you that income. Therefore, that accrued income will become an asset. See that way, isn't it? Somebody owes you money, that becomes an asset. But somebody pays you more than what they owed you, that becomes a liability for us because we have got more money than what we are owed. Therefore, this prepaid income is going to be some sort of a liability for me going forward. Why? That prepaid income will be a liability the next year when we go in there, it will start as a liability on my uh, statement of financial position. When we reverse it, this will go straight back into my rental income account. That way it reduces the uh, the the income going forward. Okay, but let's see this how this pictured in the uh, the books. So here, if you notice that here, this prepaid income was reversed, and they have also given you this is how it was from the previous year, and then also we have to record this accordingly. Okay, so now let's top it up and do that properly now. So for my bank account. For my bank account, the money is going to be coming in, isn't it? Therefore, it's a debit into my bank account and my rental income account will have a credit for the total amount we have received. So let's see that here. This one is going to be bank. 25,550. So once we create this, I now have to bring that um, the spreadsheet back again because without that spreadsheet, um, it's a bit impossible to explain it clearly. So here, let me get rid of the full screen. And this one will become with a spreadsheet here. And a little bit more. Ah, here we go. So let's delete this. And then now create the prepaid income. So as I explained you earlier, this 2720 for the March, April of 2017, this will become a liability for me. A liability is going to be always going to be a credit amount. So 2720, if I do the liability here, and this also shows you, we have to take that particular receipt out of that year's the total income. So here, if I do this one, I say it's rental income. And this here will go as a, a prepaid income of 2720. So now once we've done that, it will give you a clear picture of the, the year's total income which we are going to post in our profit and loss statement okay so now if you total all of that it's going to give me 2700 so 27980 27900 27980 minus 2720 it will give me the amount i'm going to use it to my profit and loss statement the total income 25 two six zero so this now will be the one we're going to transfer it to my profit and loss statement so the uh, once the year is finished when we're moving on to the new year the rental income account rental income account so once we've done that here this will be reversed at, at the start of the new year so we're going to simply say this is going to be rental income and this 2,720 will be cleared off on the next year. Here we're going to do exactly the same way we have done that prepaid income.
Tem um tal. This is for the value of 2020. So this is how it start for the, the next year. Same like we started with 2430. This is how we started for the following year. So it looks like the customer or your, um, what do you call it? Your client is paying every time a month in advance. So when they pay a month in advance, why that's why we're getting this prepaid income to start the year with. So this is your answer for this particular question now. So now let's look at the next question here. Answer the following regarding the prepaid income reversal of 2430 in the rental account above. You how were the elements of the accounting equation affected by this transaction? OK, so this is the reversal from the previous year. What happened there? They're simply asking you, does your asset change or not? It's not an asset, so therefore this will not change the asset. But your capital, will that change your capital? Will that change your capital? Uh, let me just get this out of the way first because you don't need the spreadsheet anymore. Uh, let me go back to Teams. Mm. Yeah, got it back now. Let's do full screen of it. So when you're doing that reversal, what happens to you? Um, um, assets, you have nothing changed in your asset because your prepaid income is your liability, which you obviously um, uh, taken too much beforehand. Therefore, this is not going to be uh, an asset. It's always a liability. But the liability itself, as you've seen there before, when we reverse it, we clearing that liability account so the amount gets put back into the the income account. So therefore, the liability is decreasing from 2430 to zero because this get put back in that rental income account. So what is that going to do to my capital? If your assets are not changing, the liability is decreasing, your capital can only increase. But can you give me an explanation why that is increasing? Why? This 2,430 pound, it is now going to be an income for you. Therefore, this is going to increase your profit. If your profit increases, your capital also going to increase. If you know your accounting equation, you know assets are equal to capital plus liabilities. So if this doesn't change, if this decreases, capital can only increase. OK, so that is the logical solution for this answer. And it's four marks for that. So it's not bad of a uh, call there. Which one of the following dates should be entered for this transaction in the ledger account? So if you notice that here, this particular transaction get entered at the start of the year on the first day of my financial period. So here, the financial year ending on 31st of March 2017, but they're still going to be asking you about this. The, the reversal. So the reversal gets done at the previous year, isn't it? First of April 2016. This is when this particular transaction is entered in the system. So it's going to be the first of April 2016, not the first of April 2017. Why? That it will go into the next financial year. We're still talking about the financial year ending on 31st of March. Uh, where's that? Uh, 31st of March 2017. The year started on the 1st of April 2016. So very careful with that as well, guys. So now let's look at that next question. You are now looking at administration expenses for the year. The, there was an accrual of 620 pounds on 31st of March 2016 which has been correctly reversed. It's been reversed. The cash book for the year shows the pre, uh, payment for administration expenses of 14,215. 
the you have a bill for administration expenses showing a total cost of 1995 for the quarter ending on 31st of May 2017, which was received and paid after the year end. So we also have another accrual or prepayment we have to decipher. So again, I need to bring my good old spreadsheet into action. And uh, for that one, I just had to share it a different way. Uh, let me see. So let's do this. Spreadsheet and that. Okay, that's fine. So yeah, got it. So let's share this question again. Uh, let's delete all of these entries now. So let's start with this. Um, admin expenses, okay? So here, what they have said to us, there was an accrual of 620 pounds. So here, accrued expense, accrued expense, you definitely know this is going to be a liability because something we owe to our expenditure. So therefore, this is the 620 pounds we have at uh, the start of the year. This was reversed. So this one was the balance more down. And then we're going to reverse it. We're going to say admin expenses for 620. We reverse it. And the administration expenses will have accrued expenses for the value of 620. You know what? Let's get a little bit bigger here. Yeah, that means you can see that without any hindrance. So this is how the year started. They're saying here cash book for the year shows payment for the administration expenses of 14,215. So we have paid from our bank 14,215. You may ask why that is on debit because on your bank account, there'll be credit because the money going out of your bank. account. Okay, this is your expenses. You have paid so far that year. And then they're also saying here, you have a bill for the administration expenses showing the total cost of 1,995 pounds for the quarter ending on 31st of May 2017, which was received and paid after the year end. So the year ending on um, May, sorry, March, and the bill was received for 1,995 pounds, which until May. So if I'm going to put a timeline here, let's delete all of this. So if I put a timeline here, this is my March, April, and May, and this is the year end. So I'm going to put a line here. This is the end of year. So let's put a line here. It's easy if I do that way. Um, yeah. So this is the year end. So what we got paid now for these three months. Was that £1,995? So this was paid somewhere in these three months. It was after the year was end. So therefore, part of that is supposed to be for this March expense. Therefore, we have accrued this expense and we have to find out how much is it. 1,995 pounds divided by three, it gives me 665 pounds was an accrued expense. We haven't cleared it yet. So this account is already clear. So I'm going to just say, I'm going to fill this with red. That means it's no longer has any balance, but now we're going to accrue a new expense. So we're going to say here, accrued expense, Expense, which you are be yet to pay of 665 pounds. And this will go here as my admin expense accrued for the value of 665. Okay, so they're asking you here, the administration expense account needs an adjustment for an accrued expense for the value of 665 pounds. The date will be the last day of the financial period, which is going to be 31st of March 
17. So here, if the ending was on 31st of March 2016 for the last year, and the new year is going to be 31st of March 2017. Okay. That is the only entry they expect you to do. They didn't ask you how much is the total expense of it yet, but let's find out what it is. Okay. By calculate the administration expenses for the year ending on 31st of March 2017 by completing the table below. If necessary, use a minus sign to indicate only the deduction of an amount from the cash book figure. So the cash book figure is that this is going to be reduced, which is the previous year's one. The opening adjustment is going to be minus 620 pounds. The closing adjustment is going to be 665. If you notice that here, because I drew the T account up like that way, it made my life a lot easier to understand how that is going to be impacting my current year's account. So if I'm going to look at 14215 minus 620 plus 665, basically plus 45 now, that gives me the year's administration expense of 14,260 pounds. That should be the, the correct answer for this. Now let's look at the last part. Show how each of the following accounts uh, balances will appear in, in an initial trial balance. Make uh, each selection by uh, clicking on a box in the left column and then on one in the right column and you can remove the right line by clicking it. OK, so you need to know whether any of them are going to be uh, an asset, liability, income or an expense. And, and if you know your debt click, you obviously know which side that's going to be on your trial balance and accrued expense. It is going to be a liability. You already know you accrued. It means you owe to somebody. Therefore, this will become a liability. It is not an expense expense. It's a a crude expense. Therefore, this is a, a credit balance. An administration expense, on the other hand, is an expense itself. Therefore, it's a debit. Interest received, it's a credit. Why? Because it's an income. And any payroll liabilities, something you owe, obviously the word liability, simply give it away. It is going to be a, a credit balance. Okay, so therefore, there will be three credits and one debit. That's not as you normally want to see. Now, we already done 55 minutes worth of, and then we done three questions so far. We still got a long way to go. Two more questions to do. Let's go into question number four. This task is about accounting adjustment. You're working as an accounting technician for a sole trader business uh, with a year end of 31st of March. Every one of that is ending on 31st of March, some kind of infatuation with that day. A trial balance has been drawn up and a suspense account opened. Oh, wow, we have a suspense account finally. You now need to make some corrections and adjustment for the year end, 31st of March 2017. You may ignore that for in this task. Record journal entries needed in the general ledger to deal with the following items. So, so with the items below, you should remove any incorrect entries where appropriate. Post the correct entries. Do not need to give narratives. You do not enter zeros in unused column cells. A refund of £398 for the electricity cost was correctly entered in the bank account. No other entries were made. So if you look at that here, a refund of electricity costs. So electricity costs is going to be normally a debit into your uh, electricity account and credit into your bank account. When there is a refund, the entry will be a reversal of it. So there will be a debit into bank and credit into your electricity, isn't it? But now this was entered into the bank account, but there's no entry into the second account, which is the electricity account. If that entry was missed, which is the credit entry into your electricity account, so we're going to say electricity cost, we make sure that amount is entered for 398 there. Since the debit entry was correct, only suspense account can be used to clear any other outstanding balances there. So we have simply found out we have to use the suspense account on the debit side and the credit side is going to be a electricity account. Next entry is going to be they simply saying here the machinery repairs costing 470 pounds were paid for using the business uh, bank debit card. 
the correct amount was credited to the bank account and debited to the machinery at cost account. So this one, it is an error of principle for you. Therefore, will not require major correction. Apart from, we have to remove this amount from the incorrect account and we have to put that amount into the correct account. So here, the debited machinery at cost account, it should not be. Therefore, we need to credit this account. So machinery at cost, we're going to credit this, the 470. So we are removing the incorrect amount and then we go back into machinery repairs. So for that one, so repairs and maintenance account, we'll have a debit entry for that one. So this error principle corrected by this correcting entry. Now let's look at the next one. Entries for prepaid equipment, higher cost, of 460 pounds were made. These were on the correct side of both relevant general ledger account, but the figure used was 640 pounds instead, the right amount of 460. So therefore, again, this will not require a suspense account. Why? Your double entries were correct. The correct accounts were used, but you used the wrong account on both accounts. Therefore, this will not require a suspense account. Why? the balances will automatically cancel each other out. So there's no need for the suspense account. So what we need to do, we have to reverse them first by removing the incorrect entry. So here, entries for prepaid equipment, higher cost of 460 pounds. Okay, so prepaid equipment, higher cost. Just can't understand it. What, what is mean by that? Yes, yeah, simply it's paying the bank. So it is normally will be entered equipment higher cost debit bank account will be. Credit. That should be the right entry for it as well as I know. Yeah, OK. So the the entry will be debit for your equipment, higher cost and credit for your bank account. So we have to reverse it. So we have to debit the bank account with 640 pounds and credit the equipment, higher cost, eight, uh, 640 pounds. This simply remove the already incorrect entry from the system. System. And then we go back to do the right entry. Now, debiting the equipment higher cost of 460 pounds and then credit the bank account for 460 pounds, which in fact will clear the error on the first instance and put the right amount back in the system for it. Because here, uh, prepaid, that means it's already paid. Okay, good. No entries were made for interest due to be uh, paid on an um, you know interest due to be paid on a loan of five thousand pounds annual interest of four or two point eight percent needs to be accounted for. So what we need to do here, interest due to be paid. Okay, so therefore this is not interest paid yet. We haven't paid it yet. This one will be classed as a liability account for you, isn't it? So this interest paid account will be one account there. Since we haven't paid it, the interest liability will be created against it. It's not paid yet. Let's find out how much is the amount. 5,000 pounds multiplied by 0 0.028. That gives me 140 pounds is your expense. One of the accounts will have a debit. Another account will be a credit. So first account will be an expense account, which is going to be the interest cost. So let's see whether we can find the uh, interest. Loan interest, statement of profit and loss here. This will be an expense for you. But the, on the other hand, the other one is going to be the loan interest payable for your statement of financial position because we haven't paid yet. We incurred that interest, but we haven't paid it yet. So one of them is an expense. Another one is a liability because we still haven't paid it. If you paid it, that will be showing as credit to your bank account. But this time, 
this is not a credit to bank account, we haven't paid it yet. So we be careful with this particular wording they use there. Now that you have posted the journals, you are pleased to see your suspense account is clear. The trial balance agree. I can or cannot conclude that the balance included are new uh, now free from all errors. We cannot still confirm that, can we? Because simply there may be more errors there because the world of all errors that suggest we can only guarantee suspense account clearing any errors not detected by the trial balance. There may be some other errors still there like that this error, this error, uh, this error, these all not supposed to be bringing the suspense account into question. Therefore, there may be some other accounts as well. So we can simply say, I cannot conclude the balances included are now free from all errors. Okay, it can be more errors there. We don't know yet. I can or cannot conclude that inventory valuation uh, for 31st of March 2017 is included in the trial balance. So here, they haven't said anything about the, the inventory valuation there. So let me just check it quickly. Uh, where is my team's? I haven't said anything about the inventory valuation here, isn't it? So there is no mention of it at all. So we cannot conclude, can you? Because if there is no mention of it anywhere here, or there is no inclination of a stock check, you cannot include that, conclude that an inventory valuation as at 31st of March 2017 is included in the trial balance. You cannot. It's not there anywhere to say. So we're not going to assume you can. You cannot. Simply you cannot because there's sufficient information, insufficient information to state uh, the obvious there. Now let's look at the last one. You are working as an accountant technician on year end accounts. The following are situation which uh, way you may have to adjust uh, record adjustments here. So they are asking here, which one of the uh, these would be acceptable professional behavior if actioned by you? A client wants to improve profit figure. He asks you to bring forward the date of the large sale invoice into the current year. It's, it's completely wrong. We cannot do that one. So this is not appropriate, acceptable professional behavior. That's not the right answer. Your firm tell, uh, needs to meet its deadline for preparing final accounts. Your supervisor tells you to save time by using net realizable value for all items in the inventory valuation. You cannot do that. It is going to be either lowest of the net realizable value or the the cost. OK, so this is cannot be accepted as that answer. The client's sales manager wants you to accrue for a bonus based on the current year sales. The bank statement shows the bonus paid in the next financial year. So you cannot show that as well because this is going to be contradicting your accrual accounting basis. Therefore, this is not an acceptable professional behavior. The last one, one of your client's credit customer is going out of business. You feel this news can be disregarded as the effective date of business closure is after the year end date. Of course, it's fine because if they're going to go out of business for the next year, that is something you don't have to worry about for this current financial period because for your current financial period, uh, hold on. I wasn't looking at the right one properly by the look of it. This is wrong because this one, uh, one of the credit customers going out of business, you feel this can be disregarded. No, you cannot because there is a word we call going concern. If you think the business is not going to be a going concern, you cannot deal that accounting uh, as you go along now. So you have to make sure you take um, this part very um, decisively because for you, you have to be looking into this as something of a, a flag. You just start bringing it up to the, the business and we have to let them know about this because um, if they're going to go out of business, of course, this is going to create uh, a recoil debt or anything like that way. So you cannot ignore that until the next year. But on this third one, though, I didn't read the question carefully. 
the client's sales manager wants you to accrue for a bonus based on the current ES sales, the bonus based on. The bank statement shows that bonus was paid in the next financial year. So if they accrued it and they paid it for the next financial year, that is correct because the, the bonus was due for that year, it was paid on the next year. So you can only accrue it on this financial year because that will be obviously paid on the following year. So this one, if I read it properly, Obviously, these wordy questions can be interpreted completely different different ways. But then I notice the fourth answer cannot be right. So the only other appropriate answer can be the third one. So the correct answer is the third option. My apologies, guys. Maybe I just read it too quickly there. Now let's look at question number 1.5. So here, uh, this task about period and routines using the accounting records and extended trial balance. You're preparing the bank reconciliation for a sole trader, 31st of March, 2017. The bank, uh, the balance showing on the bank statement is credit of 4924. That means we have money in the account and the cash in the, the, the balance on the cash book is 30, uh, 3057 on the debit side. That is also mean we have money in the account. The bank statement has been completed with the cash book and the following points are noted. So there are six points are there. Using the table below to show three items that should be should appear on the cash book side of the reconciliation. Enter only the figures, uh, one figure for each line. Do not enter zeros in unused cells. So here, the bank balance according to my uh, uh, 4924 and the cash book balance is that. So what they're asking you now to find out what are the three entries we have to record in the cash book. These are the ones are in your statement, but not in your cash book. So that means you have to update your cash book with that one. There are only three entries you need to be doing here. So the first question is, a check for 63 pounds was received from customer was dishonored by the bank on the last day of the accounting period. No adjustment has been made in the accounting reports. So what that actually means, in your cash book, you have already done this as a debit to your bank account. On your cash book, it says 63 pound debit, but it was dishonored by the bank on the last day of the accounting period. So the money is not part of this new balance of 4924 because they have simply knocked it out. So if you debited your bank statement, sorry, bank account in your so cash book, uh, bank account or your cash book, whatever it is there, that 300, uh, on the 3,057 pounds, we need to take this 63 pounds away. So we're going to say item one has to be credited for the value of 63. The next one is a customer has overpaid. OK, two remittance advices for 630 pounds each have been received and processed in March. The two backs credits are on the bank statement. So what we really have to do here, we have to give them a refund. But do you have to do anything with the the, the cash book because the customer has overpaid two remittance advice of 670 pounds has been received and they're both processed. So do we have to do our cash book? Of course, we have to offer them a credit note, isn't it? So therefore item two can be used, but let's see whether we have more items to be worried about. So let's mark it other way around this way. This one, I'm going to tag it and we'll come back there to see whether anything else there needs to be updated. An advice has been received from the bank showing the bank charge of 92 pounds. This has been entered into the cash book. It's not yet on the bank statement. So therefore, we know this one, it's already recorded in the cash book. It's not showing the bank statement. This is simply down to our timing difference. Bank statement will probably show that on the next month. Our cash book is already entered. Therefore, I don't have to do anything with it. So we can ignore that one. A direct debit payment of 128 pounds has been recorded in the cash book as a receipt. 
So if you have entered that as a receipt, it was initially entered on the debit side. This is not correct. It's a payment. Therefore, this has to be cleared from your cash book from the debit side and had to be entered on the credit side. So it has to be two entries there of 128 pounds into the credit side of it. So it's going to be 256 pounds. So item number four, it's going to be 256 pounds on the, the credit side to reduce the, the amount now. So let's see whether we have more. A bank receipt of 1,590 from the customer appears on the bank statement, but is not yet recorded in the cash book. Oh, in that case, this has to be recorded properly because this one has to be adjusted. Um, into our, the cash book. So let's see item number five. Item number five, this one is going to give me 1,590 because this is not recorded in the cash book and uh, it is definitely on the bank statement. A faster payment for the supplier uh, of 504 pound has been delayed by the bank due to a change in the receptionist uh, recipient's account number. It is not showing on the the bank statement. So we already done this on our cash book, but it's not showing in my bank statement because there's a change in the recipient account number. It is so not a concern for us for our cash book. Cash books already have that recorded. Therefore, this is not the, the right answer. But this one, number two, if the customer has overpaid, two remittance advices of 670 pounds has been received and processed, and two backs credit on the bank statement, which is okay because your cash book and your bank statement matches. There is no need to update them as you, you know, as you have to do that by doing a bank reconciliation. What you can do though, you may be able to offer them a credit note or pay the money back in the future, but you don't have to do that at now because that is something you can be doing later on because it is not necessary, absolutely necessary. The customer probably want that money back straight away. You probably say, I'll buy more goods from you later on. Therefore, this is something you don't have to update your cash book with. So these are the three updates you're going to do. So let's see here, once we've done that, whether we have any other issues going forward with it. So let's see that now quickly. The first one is, The cash book of three thousand fifty-seven pounds. Let's find out new cash book balance. I'm going to add fifteen thousand, uh, sorry, one thousand five hundred ninety to the cash book balance. Take away sixty-three and take away twenty uh, fifty-six. So we have four thousand three hundred twenty-eight as my new cash book balance. Then now let's do the bank reconciliation. What is your bank reconciliation? Has to be bank reconciliation. Has to be. 4,924, it's your balance according to your um, uh, cash book, uh, sorry, the, 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 the bank statement, and you add any outstanding lodgements. There's no outstanding lodgements there, but you do have two unpresented checks. One of them is the 92 pounds check, and you have that 504 pounds, which you have to give to uh, the supplier, which delayed, obviously, you're going to take that away from 4924, and I'm going to getting uh, 4328, which is my cash book balance. So this is a way to verify whether you have done everything correct. You don't have to do it. I do that for my own pleasure, because normally when I do this calculation, I make sure I have done the necessary adjustments right. That is a step further than what you need to do. But if you know how to do them, it gives you some sort of a, uh, uh, what is that again? Some sort of a closure, whether you have done your calculations all correct now. Because I just verified and double checked my bank reconciliation. If I have to do it, it matches my values. So that's fine. So now let's look at the next one. Next one here, as an accounting technician, why it is important to follow the organization's uh, organizational policies and procedures? Choose one. To eliminate the possible uh, possibility of numerical errors, organization policies and procedures? No, nothing to do with that. To gain authority to access the record necessary for your day-to-day -day work? Can be. 
to help enable both individual team responsibilities uh, to be understood. Mm, looks like that. Let's see if this comes with any other answers. The fourth one is going to be uh, uh, to add to your technical knowledge as the part of your continual professional development. I don't think there's anything to do with any of it apart from the third one, because this way individual and team responsibilities are you uh, ingrained in you. Uh, the, the organizational policies and procedures are basically something to do with how you're going to be uh, dealing with what is required of you in the business. So this is probably the the most appropriate answer now. Now let's look at this adjustments. What do you need to do here at the end of here? And then obviously you have to do your statement of profit and loss and your statement of financial position. And then of course you need to remember how this amount is going to be adjusted and entered into these relevant cells. So allowance for doubtful debt, it is something we call a liability. We just going to keep it against. It's not an expense, so this will go in my statement of financial position. Bank account has a debit entry start with and then credit entry on your adjustment. So two four minus two four one six. That gives you three three one zero. This is going to be an asset. Therefore, this is going to be in your statement of financial position. Capital also has an adjustment there. Plus uh, 9430 and this is going to be in my statement of financial position 28500. And then closing inventory, obviously it's going to be uh, one here, 751. Uh, one, one zero and on my statement of financial position also it's going to be uh, the same again if you know, ask me why because your opening entry will be a debit and the closing inventory will be a credit why because your cost of sales is found by um, using your opening inventory plus the purchases minus the closing inventory which will be used in your profit and loss statement and then the closing inventory will become the non current asset of my stock at the end of the year this will be carried out the next year and this obviously become the opening entry uh, or inventory next year uh, depreciation charges and expense so this is going to go in your statement of financial position sorry statement of profit and loss and, uh, let's see irrecoverable debt it's an expense so 490 pounds here uh, office expense there's an adjustments there two to two plus 1320 it's going to be 34,542 there opening inventory of course is going to be as i mentioned earlier part of your cost of sales calculation so it's going to be a debit into my profit and loss statement other payable is going to be your liabilities 1460 plus 1320 and that gives me 2780 on my statement of financial position Payroll cost is an expense, 28381. Uh, purchases is going to be obviously part of my cost of sales. It goes here as an expense. Purchase ledger control account, it's going to be a liability, 19402 plus 495. That's going to be 198. Nine seven, and then your sales is going to be your expense two six eight zero seven seven, and the sales ledger control account is an asset, which is going to be uh, thirty eight thousand nine hundred and thirty four pounds. Your suspense account will have no longer any balances because started with five on the credit side, 490 here, 495 on the debit side. So there's no longer any value there. So we don't have to uh, populate those boxes. And then there's a credit amount start with on VAT and there's a debit amount on the adjustment. Therefore, it is going to be a liability still, but it will be a reduced amount of 2809. So this is going to be going here. A VAT as a liability of 2809 on the statement of financial position and then vehicle at cost 22280 plus 
9430, that gives me a value of 31,710. And last but the least, the accumulated depreciation will go against that here. A73, if you notice that, that amount, it's going to be a liability on my statement of financial position. And then now we have to find whether we have a profit or a loss. So here, this, since the credit side is higher than the debit side on my profit and loss statement, it is definitely a profit and loss for the year. Profit and loss for the year. This is going to be the difference between those two amounts, 285587 minus 263482 for the value of 22,105 pounds. And this will go opposite on my statement of financial position as part of my profit, and then that will eventually match my statement of financial position. Your debits and credits on that one will match once I put this profit and loss for the year. For getting this right, why this is most important for you, I know it's got only 11 marks here, but mostly it is how the adjustments are laid out. So if you have a debit balance here on my ledger balance and the adjustment is on the credit side, Obviously, this is going to reduce that amount. And if you on the same side, for example, here, other payable credit amount, this is a credit amount. This is obviously going to be added that together. So it's going to be a uh, the bigger amount. There. And then, of course, a debt click knowledge is thoroughly important for you to find out whether it's going to be an expense, income, or an asset or liability. It depends on where you classify them will lead you to get your profit and loss statement and the financial position statement of financial position right. So that concludes the assessment. Let's submit the uh, exam and see whether I have successfully completed it. I think you may have because this is the exam students, you know, sometimes get 99 marks. You get one small error somewhere there. Some of the students scrape through with 70 and 71 marks. And uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, can be one of your make or break uh, assessments when you come to level three as well. If you look at that, students sometimes take it too easy on your foundation uh, accounting cert uh, certificate and accounting uh, course. And then they think, OK, level three is going to be fine. We're just going to be just you know rolling as normal. And then suddenly you hit a speed bump and this is the module that acts as a speed bump because it does not give you any respite. It doesn't give you uh, like a breathing space. Put it that way, it can consume your, what do you call it again? Um, I, I will not say it will consume your soul or anything like that, but it can consume the time and knowledge you're going to be put towards it because you need to concentrate a lot on this exam. And then, of course, you need to make sure read the questions very carefully read the questions again, check the answers again, and then of course, trust your instinct. Most of the time, your instinct's fine. Look for keywords, look for something so trivial, it might be completely changing the answers uh, you have initially put down there. Sometimes, you know, don't change it because you have to change it, but just put your thoughts into it and say, oh, will there be a uh, um, something appropriate for me to change something there or just stick to the initial conclusion you come to. Most of the time, you will find your initial conclusion may be right, but if you can argue against that fact and then you'll be able to change your answers, of course, that means you have done yourself uh, a, you know, a great job there because you basically convince yourself there's something wrong and you went there and corrected it. And that is kudos to you as well. OK, guys. So I'm, I'm um, you know, going to be completing this video and uh, please make sure if you guys watching this video, subscribe to the channel and then put your comments down there and, you know, put a request if you need any other videos to be recorded. And of course, I'll try to record the advanced bookkeeping part one as well, uh, which is a lot easier than to this exam. Part two seems to be the, uh, the more, um, more the tougher one. Uh, it's a tougher exam compared to the first one because the first one I found it, uh, you know, fairly simple. Uh, similar kind of questions, of course, but it's simpler than the the assessment too. And um, of course, um, I will be making more videos in uh, coming days, and then of course I will be doing 
um, the new release of the AQ 2016 uh, 2022 module um, exams, and I will be uh, sitting on them, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, work through those before I will start record those and then possibly re um, releasing the first series of videos uh, starting from August. And then, of course, um, until probably September, I'll be doing a few more videos of that. And uh, obviously, you probably see the difference between the both different qualifications it will not be much, but end of the day, the exams are merged together. So if you go to level three on uh, the 20, 22 module, the advanced bookkeeping and the final accounts preparation are now combined into a, a new unit and one massive unit with massive implications there. So you are in for a um, what do you call it, a surprise when you go into level three and if you're doing 2022 20, qualifications. So guys, um, have a pleasant evening and hopefully you enjoy this video and I'm looking forward to hearing from you again. And then um, let's see. Uh, I don't have anything else with this one. And just bring it back here. Um, yeah, and that's about it, guys. All the best. See you later. Take care. Bye bye.